we are moving into a world that's becoming increasingly fractured, not just internationally, but also domestically as well. And this is especially true in the U.S. So we are entering a world where people kind of don't really share or agree on basic values and basic tenets. And that's internationally. For example, you see, you know, it's very important for uh, for Russia to to have Ukraine to feel safe, and you know, it's probably very important for China to to have Taiwan to feel unified as well. And internally in the U.S., you have very con- much contentious issues. You know, polarization is extreme, and that actually opens the door to tremendous amounts of social disorder. So, you have a system that's kind of breaking. But it's not getting enough information to fix itself, so that further cements its role of fracturization. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world, so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind: all the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also, understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager Niels Kostrup Larsen. A new world order is emerging, and in our global macro series, I, along with my co-host Jem Kasang, want to dig deep into the minds of some of the most prominent thought leaders to help us better understand what this new global macro-driven world may look like. We want to explore their perspectives on a host of game-changing issues, and hopefully dig out nuances in their work through meaningful conversations. Our guest today is a true insider when it comes to what goes on inside the Federal Reserve, as he spent five years of his career on the open market desk. The desk sits at the center of the dollar system as its ultimate and infinitive provider of dollars. It has access to virtually all regulatory and financial data. As well as open lines of communications with all major market participants, so please enjoy our conversation with Joseph Wang, aka the Fed Guy Twelve. Joseph, welcome and thank you so much for joining Jim and I today for what I'm sure will be a very insightful conversation as part of our global macro series. How are you doing? How are things where you are today? I'm doing a little well. Thanks so much for inviting me. I'm a huge fan of your podcast, and I really appreciate being invited today. Yeah, well, that's very kind of you to say. Thanks so much. Now, since this is your first time on our podcast, perhaps I could ask you to set the stage and provide a little bit of context for our conversation、um, by maybe sharing some of the highlights from your journey to where you are today,、uh, which I think listeners will find very relevant for today's conversation and when we dive into lots of different topics、uh, afterwards. Sure. So I have a pretty unconventional background. I started my career as an attorney. So I I graduated and I worked in a large law firm for a little bit. But I realized that really really wasn't what I wanted to do.、Uh, I'm not sure if you guys know, but working as a lawyer, it's basically like writing term papers for the rest of your life. It's not what anyone really aspires to do. And so I got tired of chasing commas, and I wanted to do something different. And I graduated in 2008, and at that time. What everyone was talking about was one, what central banking, and two, financial markets, and that was really attractive to me because,、uh, first of all, I felt law was kind of artificial. Rather than finding some kind of objective truth or how that the system works, it was really kind of like you know making shaping outcomes the way you want it to be. So I was, I guess, more drawn to understanding how the world works and. Being able to understand, let's say, how the financial system works, how the markets work, seemed much more interesting and exciting to me, and that's kind of the field that I wanted to work in. At the time, it was really difficult to transition from from law into、uh, into finance. So what I ended up doing、um, after sending out too many resumes was、uh, eventually I went back to school,、um, got a degree in、uh, financial economics, and then moved into the private sector. So I was a credit analyst for for a little bit. 
And ultimately, I found my way onto the open market desk at, at the New York Fed. So for those of you who don't know, the Fed actually has a trading desk. It's where they do their uh, QE operations, their repo trades, their FX swap trades, and so forth. And it's a phenomenal learning opportunity for people who are interested in markets. Um, you can think of the Fed, well, I think of the trading desk, the desk, as they call it, as one of the centers of the global financial system. Um, the desk is basically... The, one of the ultimate and infinite providers of dollar liquidity to the entire world. When, for example, in March, when the treasury markets were breaking, it was the desk that was doing, say, trillions of dollars in QE, doing hundreds of billions of dollars in repo and hundreds of billions of dollars in FX swaps, right? So when you're at the desk, you are, you are one of the first people to hear about when something is breaking. And you hear very loudly because they all call you. And you are, the, you are one of the people who can do something about it. So it's a, it's a really good way to get an inside look at, as to how the financial system works. And it's been a, it was a phenomenal learning opportunity. So I was there for five years. And eventually I decided that, you know, I, I'm really not learning anything here anymore. So now um, I write a blog and I teach people about how the financial system works. I have books and I have online courses and mostly I trade my own book. So that's what I do now. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Great journey. And by the way, I can appreciate your comments about a lawyer. My father was a lawyer or is a lawyer, you could say, and, and my wife is as well. So I'm kind of uh, surrounded by it. Now, <laughs> um, I want to start out by asking you about your thoughts on a paper that was released as recently as on Friday. So I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it came from the Minneapolis Federal Reserve President, Neil Kashkari, and it was titled, Policy Has Tightened A Lot, Is It Enough? Um, so this is kind of two days after the Fed meeting ended. Now, my understanding is that Kashkari is, without a doubt, the most dovish of the members of the Fed. But after reading his paper personally, I think that you can take it a step further and say that he's also the most out of touch, perhaps. I don't know if you had a chance to read the paper, if you're familiar with it, but I want to give you a few quotes that I received from a friend who did, and I kind of love your reaction to it. So one of the quotes from the paper was, because the FOMC has strong credibility with market participants, they take our forward guidance seriously as they should. It goes on to say, just before the pandemic hit, the 10-year real rate was about 0%, and today it has returned to about 0%. And final quote I'm going to give you is, I believe monetary policy was roughly at a neutral stance shortly before the pandemic. Long-term real rates have now returned to roughly that level. What do you think when you hear someone like from the FOMC uh, talking like this? at this time, you know. So I, I have not read that paper, but, you know, when, it talks, when they talk about credibility of policy, there's a couple of ways you can look at this. And Chair Powell was asked about this at the press conference too. One is whether they have enough credibility such that their tools work, and the other is whether they can actually achieve their outcome. Now, I think what usually they do is defer to the former, that is to say that when they say through forward guidance that they will raise rates and so forth, you immediately see that uh, move price into the market. So in that sense, the market believes that they have the mechanism, the tools to actually enforce their forward guidance. And so that gets priced into the markets. Now, with respect to actually achieving their goal, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm skeptical about just looking purely on things like tips, or other market-based measures, because um, there's a lot of distortions in those things. One is that, you know, for example, with the Fed was doing QE in 2020, they were buying a disproportionate amount of tips. And that, according to studies from BIS, that was somewhat distorting the signals that you would get from real rates, right? right? So things, mechanical things like liquidity, they matter. And also, of course, there's things like passive investment. If you, there's actually a very good presentation from, um, TBAC, the, the Treasury Borrowing Advisory, a couple of years ago, that shows that passive investing is becoming a, more involved in, let's say, these inflation protected securities. And so that again, those be, those are buying that is not about fundamental views, but simply about flows and assets. So when you talk about these market signals when it comes to real rates and so forth, I, I would be skeptical about, about that. And also, of course, yields and things like that have never been very good predictors. So I, I don't think you could just look at as 
the paper appears to do look at market signals and make a judgment as to what the Fed's credibility in achieving their goals are. You can also look at it in another way in that if you're looking at, let's say, the neutral rate as the Fed assumes to be, um, I think, half a percent and so forth. Now, that's something that's really diff- that's a really difficult framework for me to use because this whole idea about the neutral rate assumes, in my view, too much about uh, what drives things like growth and inflation. There are many things that drive it. For example, expected demand or, for example, changes in technology. To change to, to think that pulling this one lever out of a machine that has you know hundreds of levers actually makes that big of a difference, I think that that um, th- that gives too much importance to to what I understand is the only policy lever they have, um, but um, it is just one input out of many that determines the real economic conditions. Yeah, no, absolutely. I want to throw in one more question for you, and then I'm going to leave it to uh, to Jim to take over for for a little while here. But just staying on the central bank policies around the world, um, I have this mental picture, at least, that in the beginning, like in 1980s and 1990s, as the globalization really got into gear, uh, that the major e- economies around the world became more and more synchronized, if I can call it like that. So when the U.S. were doing well, so was the rest of the world and vice versa, as opposed to the way it used to be, um, where you could have one part of the world, say Japan, doing well and other parts of the world doing poorly. And therefore, you would see that there was a different kind of monetary policy being pursued by the central banks. So first of all, I don't know if you agree with that simple observation, but more importantly, do you think that, uh, as I do at least, that this is changing now and that we're actually coming back and we're starting to see more divergence uh, in this world of central bank policies and and what consequences that might have? So I, I do agree with that observation. I think that's just the function of both globalization in the real economy, let's say there's more trade, a more integrated economy in terms of things like supply chains, and also open capital accounts. So money flows freely throughout the world. And you can see this very obviously in the bond market, for example. Um, there's a lot of rich work showing that yields basically co-move together now since you know money can easily move elsewhere. Um, in terms of things like the real economy, um, you can again see this close integration when we had tremendous fiscal stimulus in the US that, that also boosted factory conditions in China since you know so much of the demand flowed throughout the world. And then again, that flows through throughout supply chains globally. I, I do suspect that, that that is reversing and it's reversing both in the real economy sense and in the monetary sense. So in the real economy sense, what appears to be happening is we have a world that is in the incipient stages are becoming more fragmented. And you have an axis that seems to be developing between, let's say, uh, Russia, China, let's Middle East, India, and the rest of the Western world. And that's going to have real impacts between, because for now, for example, commodities and supply chains won't flow as freely, so you will have more divergent economic conditions. Demand shocks in the U.S. may not pass so easily into the rest of the world. And you also seem to have greater divergences in in monetary policy, perhaps in in recognition of this. So, for example, globally, we have uh, much of the central banking community moving towards tighter accommodative policy, but not the Bank of Japan. And that's causing major, major uh, fissures in, in the uh, FX markets. You can see uh, USD JPY basically going parabolic. So um, that seems to be more fragmentation in the in the central banking world as well. So I, I agree. Well, I don't know if that's what you hold, but <laughs> but it seems it seems that that is what's happening in the world. We are reversing several decades of uh, convergence and globalization. Yeah, what's on your mind, Jim, this morning? Well, I, I'd love this. Uh, you referenced a little bit earlier here, Joseph, the kind of the machine, right? And I'd love to kind of just start at the very beginning of of painting your picture, you know, as somebody who's been on the inside of of how that machine actually. Works. I know it's incredibly complicated, and and I I don't want to you know go through every pipe, if you will, but if you were to kind of uh, you know paint a more toy model, you know one that I have had in my mind, and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. I've kind of discussed a little bit is is really um, how much monetary policy has moved to a more supply side um, tool, right? 
Um, in the last 40 years, we've seen uh, monetary policy really be something that, that works through the capital channel, right, um, towards corporations, um, helping, you know, support their growth. And, and a lot less of that, you know, used to flow via that economically to labor, but via globalization, via technology uh, and whatnot, we see a lot less trickle down, if you will. Um, and so I really think of it as supply side economics, essentially, but in a world where that supply side trickle down just doesn't really work because of the system anymore. Um, and that's driven a lot of inequality because all the money's driven, gone to capital. Um, and again, this is my mental model. This is, you know, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. Obviously, there is still a demand channel, which is primary through the wealth effect. Um, and I think that wealth effect piece has become a, an increasing uh, lever, right? That maybe the only lever on the demand side that the Fed has anymore. So that's my mental model. And those are the two primary things. But I think it's primarily a supply side issue. And then my follow up question, I guess, once, you, once we talk about that is given those levers and given that machine um, that you see, um, you know, will reducing liquidity um, in this system actually be able to address uh, the problem of inflation? Oh, those are really good questions. You know, I, I, I agree with you, Jim. I mean, if you look at, if you look at what monetary policy has done in, in the, uh, let's say the past two decades. So monetary policy, basically the way that the Fed enacts it, it's, it's mostly about interest rates. And when you lower rates, uh, you do seem to basically, as you describe it, have a supply side policy. And the way that you easily see this is, you know, who, who benefits the most from, from these lower rates? And you can see, for example, the corporations now, they can go tap the bond markets at rates that are barely above treasuries. And what do they do with the money, though? It, it doesn't trickle down in terms of more hiring or, or more uh, investment in factories or so forth. What it, what it ends up doing is just going to more stock buybacks or maybe more executive pay and things like that. So it, it does seem to be I guess pushing capital into into industries that really don't need capital anymore, and so it just ends up uh, pushing in, into uh, asset inflation, and uh, so it, it doesn't seem to have have been effective in doing anything other than that. So there probably is some marginal flow through to 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 the rest of the economy, but um, you know it's disproportionate. So uh, unless you have some kind of I guess, values where you just value, where inequality, things like that, don't figure in. And every marginal bit of help to the, I guess, lower income people helps, then that could work. But um, but that does cause socially undesirable uh, distributional effects. I agree with your view that the Fed's main tool today seems to be through, um, through the wealth effect. That has to do, I think, with the fact that the wealth effect is kind of the most the thing that can get you the fastest reaction. So, if you were to lower and to raise rates, the the way that monetary policy feeds through the barter system, it's it's not easy. There are many mechanisms. It's not easy to measure them, and um, sometimes they take time. For example, um, looking as to the context we have today, we have a lot of inflation. So the Fed is raising rates. What exactly does that do? Well, I mean, you can think of it as reducing the, uh, raising the opportunity costs of, of uh, money. So, for example, maybe if, you, if rates are 2%, you are less likely to go and buy something. Sure, that, that may be the way that it works, but, you know, that takes a long time to filter into to the broader economy. So even if we were to rates to 2% today, you know, deposit betas, which is how, um, let's say, deposit rates are affected by the policy rate, are very low. So you're, most people are still going to see zero in their checking account. If you put in a money market fund, the money market fund is going to take a large chunk for its fees. So, you know, that, that's really not going to sell the economy down I mean, because it doesn't feed through at all. Um, if you think of it as a uh, borrowing or lending channel, um, higher rates, yeah, I could see that. But, you know, um, that's going to take a while as well because a lot of the borrowing corporations are in fixed rates. And until they reset uh, and they, re they refinance their debt, it's going to take a while. So the most immediate impact uh, that, that Fed policy seems to operate under is, is the wealth effect. And that's, that's already happening. You can see, see that in the very large losses that a fixed income holders have had. Uh, Jim Bianco has a very good graph showing how large loss, the losses have been historic year to date. And you can see that in declining equity prices. And that seems to be 
the primary, the fastest and most effective way channel that monetary policy operates under. But you know, it it, it could be effective, but it really does de depend on the distribution of of those assets and how it feeds into demand. So what the Fed is basically doing in this way is that they're haircutting wealth or they're taking money out of the system so that there's less demand. Um, asset prices are unevenly held in the economy. So um, it could decrease demand more for, let's say, a Porsche than, let's say, uh, a Honda. So, <laughs> but, um, but, but it, it, is, it is effective, I think. And um, I suspect that we'll see its impacts uh, shortly. But it, it, is, it is an unconventional channel, um, but uh, one that since the GFC, since the Bernanke Fed, the Fed appears to be more willing to deploy. Yeah. I I couldn't agree more with, with what you just said. I mean, if you think about the last 40 some years, right, since we've had really this, this monetary policy um, driven economy, um, we've experienced secular deflation, right? Um, and, and again, if you think of it again in my mental model, which I think you generally agree with, um, if the wealth effect is the way you're, you're affecting demand, yet most of the effects um, of of, in, of increasing monetary policy is going to supply. You know that supply is ultimately and it's created a technological revolution. In my opinion, it's it's you've funded free money essentially to extend duration. Corporations are looking at twenty forty year um, outcomes now, right? Uh, you know that was cash flow used to matter, doesn't really matter, or hasn't for forty years. And those are, that's, that technology, you know, it takes time to develop, but that deflationary, the globalization that's driven by more money in corporate hands and the pressures to reduce cost, um, at the corporate level have all fed through to a very, you know, again, well documented deflationary environment for the last 40 years, which has just led to more monetary policy. Um, and so it's been a bit of a loop. Despite all that, we are getting a, we have gotten a wealth effect clearly for 40 years. Um, yet that wealth effect hasn't been enough to counteract really that deflationary impulse, I would argue. And so the question is, you know, if you have these two channels, you have this kind of demand side that's going through the wealth effect and everything else is really going to capital. And these supply demand forces are really, you know, for 40 years, they've had to do historic more kind of uh, pumping of, of markets and supporting the wealth effect just to counteract the deflationary forces. Why would we now say that removing that money off the table is somehow going to create a deflationary effect as well, right? Um, I mean, we've had, by pumping money in the system, created a deflationary effect. And now the broad argument, and everybody seems to think that, okay, well, in removing it, it's also going to be deflationary now. And I just, I, it, to me, it's counterintuitive that if we've had a deflationary environment driven by monetary policy, record monetary policy, why removing that record monetary policy would somehow um, counteract uh, the inflation that we're seeing that's really been driven from the fiscal side and uh, external forces now. Anyway, I'd love to hear no, your thoughts. I, I agree that, that, so if you think of, if you think of one of the components of inflation today is, is because there's a negative supply shock, then logically in, in the long run, you'd want to have more investment to be able to increase production. And then finally, you could have increased supply, right? So when I look through the past 20 years, I, I think, well, last few decades, I think that there are actually some real economy impacts that, that are having bigger imports, bigger impacts on inflation, deflation than simply what the Fed is doing. And one of them, as you noted, is fiscal policy. So, you know, it, what, one of the big things that has coincided with this surge in inflation with, is a fundamental rethink in how fiscal policy is conducted. And for the past few decades, we've had an idea where, you know, maybe we should have a balanced budget, or at least some people have. And broadly speaking, that, you know, the budget deficit has been growing, but, you know, compared to standards today, not that much. But in the past couple of years, that's completely changed. And I think of that as more of that rather than anything monetary policy does as more of a driver than inflation going forward. So... The, the way that I would look at it is is to see that when you are a sovereign and you're basically conducting fiscal spending and you're financing it by printing debt, what you're really doing is you're basically just financing it by printing money, especially if you're the U.S. Because in a sense, treasuries are just money that pays interest. So um, let's say you have $100. 
you know, it's printed by the government, it's money. If you have $100 in treasuries, it's also issued by the government, right? Um, it, it's not something that you can use to pay for dinner at a restaurant, but um, there are some mechanical things in the financial system, like a very deep repo market and a very deep cash market that make converting that debt into cash really easy. So in a sense, it's very money-like. And by doing that at an enormous pace, so one trillion, so we're, we're expected to have a trillion dollar deficit uh, every year now for, for the next 10 years and beyond. And if we have additional spending, like forgiving student loans, it's going to go higher. So that revolutionary shift in how fiscal policy is conducted, I think, is is probably the bigger driver of inflation. And that kind of makes the Fed, I, I think, as you suggest, not very effective because you know, the Congress is incentive to interest rates. So the Fed can raise rates and it doesn't really do anything because fiscal spending continues. That's unlike private actors, public sector actors uh, have no, are not sensitive to, to costs. Uh, shouldn't be that way, but in practice it is. So I, I, I'm not sure if the Fed is, is actually that equipped to deal with, uh, with what's coming in the coming years, even if they raise rates or even if they lower rates, simply because I, I don't know if they're, they're that big of part of the story. And you also have things that are more fundamental. For example, um, in the past few decades, we had basically an increase in the supply of labor from, from globalization and from basically younger generations growing up. But going forward, what we have is an aging population. And maybe some people find that to be deflationary. But, you know, I, I think that, you know, if you listen to someone like Charles Goodhart, which has a very persuasive argument, what that's basically doing, it's reducing the supply of labor into the world. And when you reduce the supply of labor, the price of labor goes higher. And that, of course, is, uh, is inflationary. And we're at this inflection point where aggregate speaking, overall, the global population is aging. And so we're going to have reduced labor supply. We can know in the US, for example, we already know that baby boomers are retiring just about now. So um, these are all secular trends that cannot be changed by monetary policy. So it seems that this is something I think that will, that's probably not on everyone's radar, but will be the big secular trend going forward. Yeah, I think the big change, uh, you know, in the economy and, 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 by extension, how the Federal Reserve uh, Reserve's tools operate is, is is really globalization. It really is the fact that labor domestically is no longer you know truly connected to corporate uh, wellness, right? Um, at least domestically, right? And because of that, there's been decreased union strength, and we well documented over the 40, last forty years very low uh, real income growth um, here domestically. And so that money that goes to corporations uh, ultimately, you know, fuels the, you know, it benefits the shareholders um, and not the people who buy goods uh, and not demand. Um, and that's why I think the system is very different. And I think, I think that's important to note because people broadly still are thinking about the system the same way. I mean, there's talk about Volcker, for God's sakes, and how this is, you know, Powell's Volcker moment, like... The reality is, is Volcker had a very different set of, you know, levers to pull. Um, he could dramatically affect, uh, labor and unemployment. I mean, if the Fed is tasked with maximum employment and price stability and the maximum employment part is really just marginally tied to, to monetary policy, you know, it really is this kind of wealth effect like we've talked about, which is uneven to, to individuals and, and really flows to goods in a different way. So the yeah, big point is the one you made is, is the, the reverse in globalization that's happening and, and what that means going forward. There is something interesting I would add to, to, uh, to, to your note about fiscal spending and, and uh, you know, let's say a potential Volcker-like Fed. So the, the strange thing about today's economy is that you know, the largest borrower is the federal government. So when you raise interest rates, you know, the federal government basically has to borrow more than, right? So where do they get the money? They just print it, of course, in the form of treasuries. So you, you kind of have this dynamic where you could you know, potentially have a doom loop, or let's say the Fed raised rates, let's say they really went Volcker, five, 10, you know, or more percent. Well, who's the biggest borrower? How are they going to pay for it? Right, they're just going to print even more treasuries. It's a, it's 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 a different structure, as you mentioned, and that that I think calls for a different set a different set of tools. 
Can I throw in a couple of questions on that note? First of all, I'm I'm curious. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I guess it's not that long ago where we had record low yields, even in the ten year and the thirty year. Over here in Europe, uh, we saw some countries issuing a hundred year bonds. Obviously, very fortuitous timing, I think, uh, for those who issued them, not for those who bought them. Um, why didn't the Fed issue a fifty year or a hundred year bond at the time? Do you think? It would have been genius, right? <laughs> yeah. So th there actually are, t there are always talks about this. Uh, so the thing is, so the way that this works is that they would, so if the, if the treasury wants to issue, let's say a longer term, like a 50 year, like you suggested, they would go, they would basically uh, uh, shop it around to, to the dealer community and see what they think. And the feedback they always get is that it's not going to work. There, there's not going to be enough liquidity or demand for that. Probably should have floated it in Europe, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Now, another thing that I, I find very interesting, so back, I think it's the fall of 2021, so six months ago, something like that, there was this senior advisor at the Fed named Jeremy B. Rod. He published a 27-page paper as part of the Fed's finance and economics discussion series. And in the paper, he disputes the idea that people's expectations for future inflation matter much for the level of inflation experienced today. And that's especially important right now, of course, in trying to figure out whether the current inflation surge is temporary or not, even though I think we probably know what where that debate is going to land. But the Rod paper is part of something a little bit bigger. It reflects kind of a broader rethinking of core ideas about how the economy works and how policymakers, especially the central banks, try to manage things. And in the first sentence of his paper, he writes something like, mainstream economics is replete with ideas that everyone knows to be true, but that are actually errant nonsense. And then to cut a maybe a long-winded question short, you know, here you have one of the staff economists at the world's most famous uh, and powerful central banks who effectively is saying that his employer has been focusing on the wrong things for the last few decades. I don't know if you're familiar with the paper, but what are your thoughts on, on this? Because I think actually also Jim Bianco at one point a few months ago mentioned, or maybe it was someone else, That kind of turn. It kind of sounds like the Fed doesn't really know where inflation comes from. I, I think we already know that the Fed doesn't know. <laughs> 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 you know, so I, I would frame that as a broader critique of macroeconomics. So, uh, just, just you know, Exante, how do you know whether or not the experts know anything, right? So, you, you don't, the way that you would know is you would put it to the test. So. You know, if, if you, uh, I said, Richard Hanania has, has a good point when he looks at this in, in light of what happened in Afghanistan. You have, and in that's Afghanistan, you had all these people who are, let's say, uh, PhDs and regime change and nation building and so forth. They were there for a long time, unlimited budget, like over a trillion dollars, and everything they built basically disappeared overnight, right? So it's kind mm -hmm. of obvious that these people were frauds or, you know, just were not, didn't actually know anything. If you look at this in time to take the same test and look at macroeconomics, well, you know, let's say last year, Fed, basically unlimited budget, small army of PhD economists, best data in the world, self-private sector doesn't even, doesn't even get close to, and, you know, they're telling you inflation is transitory, everything will be okay. And we kind of know how that turned out to be, right? So in my view, I don't think macroeconomics is a real field. So when Jeremy wrote critiques, things like that, and saying that, you know, the Fed doesn't really understand inflation, I think he's spot on. You know, so obviously this doesn't work. Why it doesn't work, you can speculate. In, in my own view, just it seems like you're applying the tools of physics to something that basically is not, uh, it's, it's not like a physical science. There's no underlying reality. There's no unchanging truths, right? So you're applying the wrong tools to solve the problem. So you always get answers that are nonsensical. <laughs> we kind of see macroeconomics blow up pretty frequently. So I don't even know why we, we bother to listen to what they, what they say. Um, So I, I think it's a it's a fair critique, and whether or not that that works, 
that would change anything, I, I doubt it. Um, one of the things that I've learned working in these large bureaucratic institutions is that there's no consequence to failure. Uh, you can think of it as uh, Nassim Taleb's view of they have no skin, skin in the game. Things can go well and things can go not well, but for them, they're completely insulated from the consequences. So for them to say that, you know, this is the wrong way of thinking about something, honestly, for someone who's very senior in the Fed, it doesn't really matter because, you know, if you get the call wrong, you're still there. If you get the call right, you're still there. So, um, uh, I, I don't know if it will prompt any actual real change in policy. No, and maybe it's tied to the fact that uh, I know that this was uh, blown up a little bit on, on Twitter today, actually, uh, with this uh, Fox News picture where they showed the lack of experience. Essentially, uh, most members uh, of the committee has never worked outside uh, the Fed, maybe a couple of them outside academia. Although I will say, I think actually the credit has to go to Ben Hunt. I think he's the f- one who first made that point and, and not Fox News. But, uh, but, but you know, it, it is a little bit striking, right, that you have these powerful people and none of them seem to have worked in in uh, in the real life, except for, of course, Powell, who made his $100 million plus fortune in uh, private equity, I think. But uh, there we well, are. Nils, if you think about it, the Fed's mandate is very simple. They're not actually solving a big, complicated puzzle as far as their mandate. I, I think the problem is really their mandate, right? You know, you can point the finger at the people at the Fed, but the whole system is actually the problem. Um, you know, the, the government in the U.S. was made to make passing laws very, very difficult on purpose because they wanted, you know, the founding fathers in the U.S. wanted to avoid the powers of corruption, right? The, the absolute power corrupts absolutely. So they didn't allow for something like the Federal Reserve because they knew the problems that would cause. They knew that there needed to be crises to actually solve problems, right? Um, and but then t- it was a release valve, right? That's democracy. You kind of the, the problem just gets bad enough, so you solve a problem and then you reset. What we've done by creating the Federal Reserve, which is extra governmental, in order to solve this business cycle, is essentially remove that uh, you know that those minor crises that we actually need, right, to solve problems and to keep things balanced. Um, so the system is really fragile because we've created, we're trying to smooth, uh, you know, with one tool, with, you know, incomplete, uh, you know, an incomplete mandate, um, you know, the business cycle. And guess what? They've done it. They, they've really smoothed the business cycle in some ways. But that's created much bigger problems. And that's, that's the problem with any solution, right? If you try and oversimplify and, you know, um, contain it, it, it creates bigger problems down the road. So you don't get rid of the cycle, you just make it a lot longer and bigger. And I think that's where we are. I don't know, I'd love to hear your thoughts, Joseph. Absolutely, I mean, so I think cycles serve a purpose, right? I mean, just to get at an individual level, failure is important because when you fail, well, first of all, you learn, and secondly, there are consequences. That that means that there are consequences for doing poorly, and encourages you to do better, right? So you know it, it's it's part of life. It's it's part of any natural process. When you remove failure, you create an epic moral hazard. Things become more and more fragile, right? <clears throat> the system doesn't have any feedback to learn, and so it just gets bigger and bigger until something happens where where, where it just breaks. So it, it's much better, um, as you mentioned, to have these periodic issues where, that are minor rather than to have uh, periodic huge issues that, that are, that are blow-ups. And the accountability issue is, is very important as well. So Congress, for example, accountability to elections, present as well. And what's really changed, and I don't think the Founding Fathers envisioned, was us becoming so financialized such that a central bank can be very important, and the U.S. central bank can be globally important. And yet, the people who who work there, they, you know, if you are top brass, yes, you're you, you don't you're not subject to popular mandates, top popular elections, but you do get appointed and get a, and uh, you know, by Congress. It's indirect, but the people who work there, who who do the information that filters to the decision makers, those people can never be removed. They're they're there forever. So you do have this large body of people who are basically insulated and unaccountable and holding in tremendous amounts of power. That's good sometimes. If you need people to react very quickly, let's say in March 2020, boom, they can roll out and pull out all the stops, do things that Congress could never do uh, so quickly. But, you know, if they make mistakes and they, if you know people make mistakes, then there's, there's not much that we can do to stop them either. And I would say that this inflation call from the last year was a very large policy mistake, and there's really no accountability for that. And there's no mechanism 
for that to be accountable either. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and you talk about the stress. You mentioned earlier that um, some of the work, you know, I think, we'll, you, again, I think it was Jim who posted the uh, the chart and uh, about, you know, what you're seeing in fixed income markets and this is being the worst start to any year, uh, at least since 1990. And then I think it goes beyond that because I think Deutsche Bank had a chart out at some point where they showed that since 1788, you'd never had a four-month period like this where suddenly global bonds is down, uh, you know, 11 plus percent at the time it might be even more now and of course we we you know i started out in fixed income government bond trader back in the 80s and you know clearly fixed income markets are much bigger than than equity markets and and um, they're not designed for these kind of moves really and so i'm i'm curious to know whether you think and of course at the same time we have equities now falling so equities and bonds having a negative year at the same time has only happened twice in in a hundred years this could be the third year if if we keep going like this but but the wider consequences of that if we think about potentially another banking crisis clearly banks have not done particularly well the last period of time even though people thought they would once yields were going to go up again but but also i'm thinking about the pension funds you know, which would be devastating um, because here, over here in Europe, I mean, some countries are kind of mandating pension funds to be like 70% or 80% in fixed income and and it, it's kind of complete crazy. So is that something you've thought about, uh, Joseph, uh, in, in terms of what, what the wider consequences could be? I, I think of, so I don't really worry about things like pension funds or retirement funds because the policy choice So if they were to fail, that would be really catastrophic. So they won't fail. There's a solution to this. The government will basically make them whole, paper it over, and so forth. So things like the, these retirement things or sovereign debt, that that's never uh, it's, it's never going to be a problem. The problem is always going to be the consequences of the policy actions, and that's going to be inflationary, right? So if you have, uh, let's say, a pension fund, tremendous losses, Well, the government will make it whole. How does the government do that? It, it basically just prints money. That seems to be the well-trodden out policy path now. We see this happening in the U.S. and in student loans, for example. A lot of people seem to have trouble paying it back. Okay, that's fine. We'll forgive it. What does that mean? That means that money that was created never needs to pay, be paid back again. So the, the end game for, for this is not defaults or deflation or stress. The end game, in my view, is, is, in, is just inflationary money printing. So... That's basically the consequence of all sovereigns, if you look through history, right? So um, it's an easy lever for them to pull, and uh, they've shown every willingness to deploy it. I, and I agree with that, and I and I get that. What 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 I've been thinking about, and certainly sharing uh, both on the podcast, but also when I write my updates to to my clients, is that I think we've been lulled in this um, you know period of time where we've kind of lost a little bit our imagination in terms of how markets can really humble us. And and what I worry most about is actually that we're going to get to a period where we're going to have those surprises where we all expect that bailout, right? But it doesn't show up. <laughs> and and or, or something else, right? That's really my worry is that we, we, we are getting, the crisis is becoming so big, it's been brewing for so many years that we're going to see decisions made that none of us really thought uh, would happen. It's almost like, and I know this is not really that comparable, but it's like if someone said to me a year ago that Facebook would lose 25% of its value overnight, I would have said, no, that's not going to happen. But it did happen, right? Uh, or if oil was going to go from minus $37 to $137 in, in, in 18 months, I would have said, mm, I no, don't think that's going to happen. But it did happen. So I'm, I'm very much for this open-mindedness about decisions being made that we just didn't expect. And, and I think that's going to create massive amount of volatility in, in global markets that we obviously good for Jim and, and, and what he does, but <laughs> it's going to be challenging for most other people. I agree completely. There's going to be just crazy policy choices that are made that you would not imagine. And I think they've, we've already been seeing this for the past mm -hmm. year, right? So giving everyone, shutting everyone down, giving everyone free money. Um, so, but I would think though, that if there are crazy policies, they, they wouldn't err on the side of hurting markets too much. Um, I, I remember back in 2008, for example, there was a debate in the US Congress about, I think it was TARP or some kind of something like that. I, it failed in the in the House Republican 
uh, Republican House at the time because uh, people were talking about responsible government and so forth. And, you know, the market just kind of completely imploded, put the fear of God in everyone and it passed the next day. So I, I, I think there's, there's that lever. If, if there is uh, an inclination for erratic policy, I, I think it's, it's right-tailed in the sense that it's going to be sp- towards things that are increasingly fiscally irresponsible. Things like, for example, maybe forgiving student loans uh, to, to get uh, more a bump in the in upcoming election and so forth. Um, but it is very difficult to predict because not just on the electoral stage, but on the popular voting stage, there are a lot of surprises. Um, if you just look at, for example, what happened in the French election, again, it was well telegraphed that uh, Macron would win. But if you look at if you look at the history, the track record, well, you know, people who are, uh, I guess, less predictable, like Marine Le Pen, been gaining consecutively every election. If you look at the demographics, it's actually the young who are the young who are actually more uh, inclined towards something that that is more nationalistic, and so they are gaining in power. And whereas the the older generation who would be more centrist are are waning in power. So you have you have more unpredictability. I, I definitely agree with that, and I think that's really exciting. It makes things like global macro and people like yourself, Jim, volatility is going to be a huge bull market. <laughs> so, so yeah, so this is now we've entered my my uh, my, my territory. I have a question related to this, actually. So, um, you know, the way I see it, monetary policy, because of, you know, uh, the kind of almost absolute dominance uh, of of the American system, the dollar, uh, the exorbitant privilege, has maintained um, kind of a a cage around volatility, right? It has controlled it because essentially the uh, infinite liquidity, con- you know, contains that those tails. Um, that could be the case as long as the Federal Reserve has complete dominance, right? Um, as long as, uh, you know, there's, there's no cracks in that system. That pressure, obviously, as we've talked about, uh, of, of internal risk has, has built over 40 some years, and there seem to be cracks. And I think that's the important point. Now, if that breaks, given the pressure and the leverage and everything in the system, I've talked about this. We live in an increasingly leptocritic distribution. There's that word, right? Um, fatter tails, because uh, cracks are showing in a system that has had it's like two sumos going at each other. As long as it's balanced, uh, you're fine. But the second there's there's an imbalance there or a crack in this containing thing of that potential energy, the, the consequences are much bigger and the tails are much fatter. So I see that that is the case now. The big question is, is the Fed losing control? Um, and I think this is now my question for you is, um, you know, what causes the Fed to lose control? I hear in a lot of your statements uh, that you think the Fed will ultimately be able to come back in and stimulate and, uh, you know, ultimately control the situation. Um, and and I, I would argue, and I want to hear your thoughts, um, you know, is the exorbitant privilege, which ultimately is what I think engenders the Fed's um, complete power at risk in any way, especially given the things that are happening now. So let's, I want to, I want to hear your thoughts about um, you know, if you, if you don't mind the, uh, you know, is there a risk here to the exorbitant privilege, particularly given the Russia, the, the, uh, the things that have happened with Russian assets, right, uh, at the Federal Reserve lately? You know, do you, like Zoltan Pozar, believe that, that we're entering Bretton Woods 3, right, um, I guess, essentially? Because that ultimately is what will increase volatility uh, and release kind of that potential energy is, is an instability at the Federal Reserve, in my opinion. What are your thoughts? So I think when it comes to things like rates and FX, the Fed has basically complete control. Um, you know, if it, if it comes to rates, if, you know, infinite money printer can buy it and protect it. If it comes to FX, you know, it can go and print it or they can, you know, borrow money from someone else to defend it if the dollar gets too weak. Uh, what they what they don't what they don't have power over is just. <laughs> oddly enough, inflation, a real economy stuff, because that's stuff that, that that's not financial, that can't be printed. The the change in, in the dollar status as global currency, as you suggested, and as Zoltan noted, I think that's that's real. And that is more of a monetary phenomenon than a real economy phenomenon, in my view. So it's a monetary phenomenon, because when the dollar is the reserve currency, Everyone needs to hold dollar. Every sovereign needs to hold dollars to support their companies as they as they do business. 
So for, for those of you who don't know, the dollar is the currency of international trade. About half of trade in the world is invoiced in dollars. So it's not just, let's say, the U.S. selling something or buying something from Japan. But if you're a Japanese company buying something from Indonesia or an Asian company buying something from Thailand, it's probably going to be in dollars. So dollars are used everywhere as, as a global currency. And because of that, if you are a foreign sovereign, then you hold uh, dollar assets in reserves to support to support the companies and banks uh, in, in your country. And those dollar assets tend to be U.S. treasuries. So the reserve status basically is, is, a, is a way to keep U.S. interest rates low uh, because there's tremendous amount for them. Now, what happened in Russia, bas- I think, put a crack in that system um, because the way that the way that these sovereign man, sovereigns manage their foreign reserves is that it's very, very important for them that their assets are risk-free. They're not really worried about making money, but it's very, very important for them to not lose money. And uh, just an aside, the Fed actually has a foreign exchange port- portfolio, so it's about $40 billion. Um, it's from back in the day when uh, they intervened to, to weaken the dollar. So... Um, if you are Russia, for example, you suddenly woke up and you figured out that your safe assets were actually not safe. They were just, they disappeared. Now, if you are another country, let's say China, with a very, very large amount of dollar exposure, then suddenly it becomes an existential risk, right? So what if someday maybe you have territorial aspirations that the U.S. doesn't like, or maybe you're just using too much coal and that's not green enough and how people are going to do something. That That's kind of like a sword dangling over you. And it's a national security issue. It's an existential threat. So there, there's no way that any sovereign is going to be subjugating themselves to that kind of risk. And so I, I do see them as trying to find a way out. It's not so clear what what the way out would be, but uh, they will find a way. And that ultimately means that there's going to be less uh, people buying treasuries, less of a bid for treasuries, ultimately means higher interest rates. Now that though, as I mentioned before, it's a rate thing. So it's ultimately still within the control of the Fed. If rates are too high, well, Fed will just buy it all. And if dollar is too weak, the Fed can you know, we'll figure out a way to work with their partners, borrow with FX and so forth. But what they can't do, though, is let's say the, this, this manifests itself through higher prices and in, higher inflation, higher prices in the real economy. So let's say, for example, China gets rid of all their, their treasuries and Fed steps in and just buys it all. Well, you know, that, that's going to create a lot of liquidity in the system, right? So that can manifest itself in inflation and the Fed can't print things like that. So if the Fed loses control, I think ironically it will be it's in its mandate rather than in the things that we think are its secondary mandates, things like asset prices. By the way, just out of curiosity, something I, I'm not entirely sure of, did Russia lose their FX reserves? Or are they just frozen and they can't get to them? Have they been? Uh, I would say it's the same thing. <laughs> well, you <laughs> say it is, it may... but if at some point there is a resolution to the conflict, you would imagine that Russia want to bring that part into the resolution, uh, meaning we want our assets back. This is why I think we, I don't know, to me, it feels like they've been frozen. You can't get to them. It doesn't strike me as they've been taken. At this point, I don't know. No, I could be wrong. No, you're exactly okay. right, Neil. They, they are frozen. One day, if you know, let's say the U.S. installs a good friend there to sit in that seat, I'm sure it would be unfrozen. Uh, but that day is probably really, really far into the future, if ever. That's like the difference between debt and cash. Yeah. It's almost the same so, thing, right? <laughs> just, just as an aside, so the way that the treasuries work, treasuries are basically book entries into a system. So it, it's like a huge ledger if you're into Bitcoin. So ultimately, it's recorded in the New York Fed, who owns that treasury, uh, sometimes through different layers. So if the U.S. government wants to get rid of your treasuries, they can do it. If you have a bank account that has dollars, yes, they can get to it. So it's always within their control. You're playing in their system. So um, it's uh, it's something that they always have power over. I guess the big question is where else? You know, what else is going to be? Uh, where will money go if it's if it's not coming to the dollar? Right? I mean, is there an alternative? And can I expand on that actually? Because I wanted to I wanted to ask. You know, I th- it sounds like all three of us have to we we agree on that we have to kind of reimagine what safe assets really are. And I'm curious to know from you, Joseph Boyer, what you think 
is the way for people to maybe just preserve capital? I obviously couldn't help notice uh, Paul Tudor Jones on CNBC last week saying that you shouldn't own bonds, you shouldn't own stocks for the next uh, many years. And, and, and the best way, if, if someone put a gun to his head, was to use the simple trend-following system, which made me smile, of course. But, but <laughs> what, are your, what are your thoughts on, on what safe assets are? Uh, and obviously, it depends on, on, on the investor, right? But but generally speaking, we've always thought that you know U.S. Treasuries is the safest thing you can get. But who knows? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that's a, that's something that we're, that people are everyone are racing to to invent to find out. Um, so I think what's changing in the world is that there's more political risk, and not just on the sovereign level, but on the individual level as well. If you recall what happened in Canada, you know you disagree with the government, and suddenly you lose your bank accounts, right? So this this political risk is happening everywhere, and it, it's not super clear what actually is safe right now. I think the solutions that one can have on the sovereign level are different from the individual level. Uh, Zoltan, for example, suggests a commodity-based standard, and that, that that could make sense. So the way that I see that implementing would be, for example, if you're China, instead of holding dollars, you recycle all your surplus into things like oil, uh, gold, or grains, things that you actually use. So maybe, for example, instead of picking your your exchange rate a little bit cheaper to to subsidize your exports, Maybe you subsidize your experts in a different way by offering cheaper commodities to your to your vendors, right? You maintain your competitive advantage, and you also um, you also get away from the dollar. So maybe that's a possibility. I suspect, though, that um, it's something that's yet to be found. Um, for retail, I would I'd imagine it'd be just things like real estate, gold, uh, real estate in jurisdictions that are. I think people have more confidence in in the U.S. Maybe maybe states that have stronger property rights. Yeah, I I, I think those are probably what I think of right now. But again, they're they're not ideal. They're not super liquid, and they're not easily movable. So uh, I, I think it's a solution that we're still looking for. Yeah, I mean, you touched on a lot of things where, and I I, ask, I have to admit, I I have no idea what your views are on on crypto. But I do want to ask you something because I literally just half an hour before we we went to. Uh, to have our conversation today, I saw something that was quite interesting. Um, you know, clearly, uh, I would imagine that the crypto uh, world, um, you know, will be be cheering th- their products as an alternative to dollars and safe haven and to gold. We've heard the, the stories and all of that. And then I see this guy come out with a tweet where he basically says, you know, listen, I bought uh, Ethereum at 25 cents or something, or 75 cents. I sold all of it today at $2,500. And the reason why was because he says, now it's not a non-correlated asset anymore. It's all correlated to all the other stuff we have out there, tech, equities, venture capital. So it's not doing for me what I thought it would do. And I thought that's pretty interesting. If that's because then you could say, is it then the say that's the solution? Maybe it's not because now it's just part of the mainstream correlated basket of assets. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> I'm surprised that anyone ever thought it was non correlated. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get some hate tweets uh, now. <laughs> okay. Uh, I so. I think that the crypto is actually quite da- quite a dangerous asset because, you know, the, the way that things are you know, unrolling in, in the world, it, it seems like it's it's going to be regulated and it's going to be, I think, in competition with government issued currencies. Now, this is um, people say this all the time, but if you if you actually look at what pe- like the BIS, so B- the BIS is the central bankers. They're actually kind of more like an event. They're, they're kind of like a bank, but they're more like an event planning association. They get everyone together. They kind of, <laughs> you know, they, they, they talk and stuff like that. It's like a big social party. But their communiques are, are pretty explicit that they think things like Bitcoin are just, you know, speculative things are really bad. And they're also pretty open that the world is moving, the central bank community is moving towards consensus that we will have government digital currencies. So uh, I, I imagine that what would happen is the U.S. would simply regulate all these um, private 
cryptocurrencies and then roll out their own. Um, that is ultimately a political decision. If you hear people like a former Governor Quarles, you'd say correctly that there's really no need for cryptocurrency, US digital current cryptocurrencies, right? It doesn't really serve any purpose. But um, if you have different politics, I think you will you will think differently. So it, it will it will come down to politics and who's in charge. But the trend, I think, is clear. I think I have an interesting thought here. In a world, I would argue that that the extra litigious um, expropriation, I guess, for lack of a word, better word, uh, of of Russia's assets, in a way, actually, counterintuitively, is is very bullish um, dollar, very bullish currency, and 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 I think that's not just in the short term. I think that's more long term. And, and let me paint a picture here. This is a metaphor, but if you're uh, you're in, in in middle school and and there's a bully. Everybody knows the guys like pushing people around. Whatever he wasn't around before, people didn't really care about the other big guy who's kind of a fair, more fair guy, or whatever in the room. But the second that bully enters and start pushing people around, that other guy matters a lot. The guy who has, you know, I, I think the the U.S. or whether you want to call them the bully or not the bully, the fact that there's instability now, things are at risk, right? The value of a currency is essentially the the protection, you know, the, is that capital protected? And that is to outside forces, uh, other bullies, other big entities, A, and internally, is that person fair, right? And I think most people are making the, oh, well, this isn't fair argument. But I think the reality is the U.S. is is the strongest place, both for because of military, uh, geographically, it's self-sufficient. There's a million reasons which we all know. And, and at the end of the day, I think the, the instability that's being created here ultimately leads to an appreciation for the values that the dollar provides. Um, and I think that we're seeing that with the dollar. I think the dollar strength here is essentially that. It's, you could call flight to quality, but I think it's a bit more complex than that. There are integral things that make the dollar, uh, money in the dollar system safe. Something like crypto, even though it's uh, fair in a sense, right? There is no power to protect it. It can be um, corrupted or the biggest, you know, entity in the room can in theory uh, make it uh, inaccessible, right? Um, to, to most of the world. So I, I actually, and I think Zihan touched on this, um, Niles, is I think, you know, the, the U.S.'s, um, you know, core strengths, the reason that it, it, it is what it is, um, ultimately make the dollar more powerful, more strong during a time of potential bifurcation and risk. Anyway, love to hear your thoughts. I, I, I agree with you. I mean, that's definitely what's happening here. I mean, you see tremendous flow into the dollar and, you know, it, it is, it is really, I mean, just uh, it's a strong military, of course. So it has, it's very lucky to be located basically where there's no, no, uh, you know, uh, adversaries around, around it. So it, it's definitely uh, an oasis here in, in what's happening here today. So it, it is highlighting dollar strength. Um, but it, it's highlighting dollar strength, I think, depending on who you are. I mean, if you are, let's say, uh, part of the inner circle of, uh, you know, President Putin, then it's 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 not where you running to. You're running to somewhere else. I I, may, I would think maybe it it's forcing more of what we're seeing. It might be more of a forced bifurcation. So if you're on the U.S.'s side, everyone is kind of rushing towards you. And U.S. people who are friends of the U.S. have a lot more money, so you see that very strong strongly. But if you are not friends with the U.S., and there are many people who are not friends of U.S., um, you know not good friends anyway, uh, let's say uh, the Middle East or let's say South America, those are kind of not not super strong allies, maybe not necessarily always be allies. So you can see that maybe they would have a different center of influence. So, But they are just not as influential. They don't have as much money. So um, maybe in the future that would change. So I, I think though that I, I, think, I think right now it's definitely dominated by flowing to the dollar. And I get that, and and obviously uh, Peter Zion uh, was very very convincing and and uh, very strong in his uh, opinion. Maybe that's also the reason why it's the most downloaded uh, YouTube uh, video we've posted uh, so far. Congratulations! Yeah, no, it's great, but. But and and I think you know everyone should go and listen to it because there's something that to take away from it at least in terms of okay I should be aware of what's going on from a slightly different light. But be that as it may, 
I think you can find a lot of people who basically can find all the reasons why the U.S. will be the dominant, will come out, you know, as you say, uh, Joseph, the geographics uh, that Peter also points out and the military and all of those things. But I don't know if it's just the contrarian inside of me. I'm always a little bit worried when everybody seems to all, only be able to paint that picture of why, you know, because if we go back in history, um, there is not one single system that has, you know, survived, right? There's always going to be an end point at some point. I don't know when that's going to be, and and, and maybe it's not for a long time, but I, I'm always cautious when people kind of sit down and say, yeah, this is the only way it's going to play out. I, I don't, I really don't think we can say that. Going back to my earlier point about, you know, we've lost our imagination of what could happen um and and so i'm open-minded maybe it's to the trend follow inside me i'm open-minded to to things changing course for sure so i want to just kind of start before we round off with you uh joseph we've taken a lot of your time already and we certainly appreciate that i do want to ask you just a couple of uh, things like i mean what are the things if anything um that kind of keeps you up at night when you think about um what's going on in in the world right now and you can be go as broad as you want really so I think what, so there, there's a couple of things that I, I think that are going on in the world. So in terms of the real economy, I think what's really concerning is that we are moving into a world that's becoming increasingly fractured, not just internationally, but also domestically as well. And this is especially true in the U.S. So we are entering a world where people kind of don't really share or agree on basic values and basic tenets. And that's internationally. For example, you see, you know, it's very important for, uh, for Russia to, to have Ukraine to feel safe. And, you know, it's probably very important for China to, to have Taiwan to feel unified as well. And internally in the U.S., you have very con much contentious issues, you know, what kind of rights people should have and, you know, how, how we should manage the society. The polarization is extreme. And that actually opens the door to tremendous amounts of social disorder. And you already had a taste of that, I think, in the past couple of years where there was mass rioting, and there's a lot of destruction done in many cities throughout the U.S. And you kind of don't really see that because a lot of that you could only see maybe in, in clips on, on YouTube or in Twitter. But, you know, you, you have the system where there's the feedback mechanisms, information is, is not working properly. So you have a system that's kind of breaking, but it's not getting the enough information to fix itself. So that further cements its role of fracturization. You know, I remember, let's say, I think maybe, oh gosh, maybe 20 years ago, there is a, there is a piece in the Wall Street Journal by a Russian professor forecasting that, you know what, one day the US was split apart because, you know, we have in different regions and everyone thought that was just absolutely ridiculous. I think it's a lot less ridiculous today. In fact, I would see that as if you think that things that things eventually go towards the right solution. If you have people who have fundamentally different views of the world, then federalization, you know, that that's that's a logical solution to this. So I think that that kind of political disorder is a very real risk going forward. Listen, if you have half the people in the world in, in the US thinking that, you know, election was not legitimate, then, you know, I think it's already over. Um, but that's the political side. The real economy side, though, you also, this fragmentation globally has opened the door to, to real distress that we haven't seen in a long time. So we operate in a world that has been globally connected for a long time. So if I buy something, you know, supply chain just work, energy's there, minerals are there and so forth. But if that breaks down, I think you could see, because the system is designed for efficiency, not resilience, you could see uh, tremendous amounts of distress. Uh, prices go very higher, poor countries will starve. So there's you take both of these together, there's there's a real chance of just global disorder such that you know what happens in the markets just really doesn't matter all that much because um, some some basic things that we take for for granted are being undermined. So I I think that the following few years are are going to be tremendously interesting and tremendously eventful and it's a huge volatility bull market for volatility. Uh, hopefully, whatever we make still matters though. Yeah, no, I like that answer because I actually think you're you're onto something there with with things that are maybe being underreported and but actually is is a real risk. So I appreciate that. Um, anyway, but yeah, 
Oh, just one thing. If, if, if everything else mishappens, in terms of, I think, tail risk, I would also watch the treasury market very, very closely. Right. Um, so I specialize in, in the plumbing of the financial system. And uh, so basically, there, there's reason that I think that the amount of issuance that's coming up is just historically high. And there's possible that the, the, mechan- the underlying plumbing in the system is not wide enough. There's not enough financing and balance sheet to support that. So there could be some discontinuity there in, in going forward, similar to what happened in the repo market a couple of years ago. Um, but that's a decidedly more minor issue comparing to the bigger <laughs> political themes. <laughs> no, no, I, I, it, it's great. It's really important. And of course, everyone uh, listening to our conversation today should go and get your, your book, um, you know, Central Banking 101. That it's, it's a great one. Final question for me, at least, and that is, there are so many things that uh, Jim and I could have asked you and we'd never have enough time with our guests, of course. Um, is there anything that you feel that we missed that you really wanted to uh, share with, with us today? Um any final kind of thoughts, uh, Joseph? No, I think we had a really good discussion. I, I really appreciate both of you taking the time to speak with me. Thanks for everything you've done. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Anytime. Joseph, this has been a great conversation with so much knowledge shared from your experience inside the Federal Reserve. Thanks so much for doing that today. And by the way, make sure you go and follow, subscribe to Joseph's work, as well as getting his book, Central Banking 101. You can, of course, find the links in the show notes of today's episode. And as you can tell from our conversation, we're living in a truly global macro-driven world, and it is perhaps more important than ever before to stay well-informed. From Jim and me, thanks so much for listening, and we look forward to being back with you as we continue our Global Macro Series. In the meantime, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.